Oh, this seems like a good idea. Elon Musk has dropped the parameters and all of the code surrounding the large language model, Grok. It's not just social media, now it's also open source models in the Zuck versus Musk grudge match. It's tricky to say that. Anastasian Tech just broke down the new photonic chip. 1000% faster, 400% less energy. Robots are now in charge of putting pesticides on all of our produce. And this guy, Ashan, got all of GPT-2 onto a single Excel spreadsheet. So exciting. By the way, I don't know if you've ever seen the Excel World Championships. That is so nerdy and so cool. This I did not know this existed. Dude, the hype tunnel? If you watch that, that's three hours of your life you will not regret, I promise. You wanna use your time wisely because humans are still the dominant species on Earth, 72% of the way to AGI. So not to be left out of the quantum simulation market, which probably is pretty saturated with IBM and NASA and Google, but whatever. Who knows what our quantum needs are, especially because they did a lot of weather simulations. I heard that's a really good problem for quantum computers. But what's cool is instead of building one that actually works with qubits, this enables researchers to simulate quantum computing using AI chips. Because realistically, if we do get a quantum computer working and you can't just run it all day, people are gonna wanna do simulations to figure out if what they're going for is kind of getting them down the road and then they can put it on a real quantum computer when it's ready to like, really execute the true computation. Also, I didn't really give NVIDIA the attention it deserved for a project called Groot. Now, of course, NVIDIA does a lot with digital twins and simulation, so it makes sense that there would be sort of an AI playground for robots. Now, Groot is an AI model that's meant for embodied AI. So it's like a chat GPT, but it's supposed to be bringing in information, sensory information from a three-dimensional world. And it's specialized for the shape of a humanoid robot. Now, the cool thing is it's a language model, so it understands human language. Now, if you guys remember, all the stuff coming out of Figure AI, the OpenAI sub company that we saw Figure 01 just uh, like last week do some really impressive like conversational commands. Same thing is built into Groot. In fact, uh, this is speculation, but I feel like probably the guys at Figure One or Figure AI were just thinking, oh crap, like we know what NVIDIA is about to do. We should probably put this this robot video out there a few days beforehand so we can like wow the world and like steal some of that thunder. But honestly, I was more impressed with NVIDIA than I was with Figure AI because Groot does the same thing. I mean, I was impressed with it because I didn't know Groot existed a few days ago, but Groot is natural language compatible. And it comes with an entire platform, simulation tools, and all of that other hardware in the cloud that you can utilize to train on. All right, so VentureBeat did an article on Stability AI's new stable video 3D, which I covered in the last video, but there was a new example that really showed off the product pretty well. So I wanted to show you this new example. Okay, so you have to treat these like static objects, but look at how cool that is. The lamp, that scary looking Terminator lamp, does accurately move in relation to that screen in the background. You can see the light going behind his head right up here, and that seems completely right. The way that the elbows of both sides in the shirt just stay totally in proportion. This is really cool stuff. And the coolest thing is, unlike Sora and some of the other models out there that look really impressive but nobody can use, this is available right now. It's only 20 bucks a month if you're using it for commercial purposes or you can actually spin it up on Hugging Face, just pay for the computation, use it for non-commercial purposes. Totally open source. And all of those smart folks over at Google Research are not going to let this 3D craze pass them by. There is a new image the 3D model came straight out of Google. DeepMind was part of this. It is called Melon. So here's the problem that the Google researchers are tackling. You have a two-dimensional photo and you want a three-dimensional image from it, but you do not know what if it's a photo of a person, what the back of their head looks like. Like if it's a dinosaur or a tiger, you just don't know what that side looks like. But for training these systems, a lot of time they're using curated data. So they have a nice camera and they take a photograph of say, you know, Hobbs here or whatever from multiple angles, they feed one to it and then they see if it can mimic the back but those are probably high quality images. Okay, and so this other project they're referencing was actually training directly on raw data to paper nerf in the dark, high dynamic range view synthesis from noisy raw images is about taking photographs with all of the raw information, not pre-processed or post-processed, not cleaned up, not simplified, not optimized. Like when you take a photo with your iPhone, it's doing a bunch of stuff to make it look better, right? No, this is just raw photo and seeing 
if when you use that kind of an image to construct a Nerf three-dimensional object, if it actually also solves a bunch of other problems, like upscaling, high dynamic range, it allows you to add like bokeh, that blurry look in the background. So you end up with cool effects like this. It's a denoising tool. It's the ability to add HDR colors, ability to add that bokeh in the background, or maybe it's called broke. I never know how to say it, right? But it's like, you know, if uh, portrait mode, like how you can tap on an iPhone on the background or the foreground and it blurs one or the other, it's essentially doing that. All right, so now that you know what happened in 2020 with Raw Nerf, let's take the next step and try to understand Melon, the new project that came out of Google research today. Here's what they did that was kind of unique. Now they started by putting the image through what's called a CNN, a convolutional neural network. Now this is its own AI model. These are actually a bit older, but what they do is they try to find out what's important. They assign a priority basically, or a, a focus of attention to a photograph. There's basically filters that they're looking at, but the filters over time have learned what does matter and what doesn't. So now that they have that information about what's important in the photo, that can be used to explain before I create the nerve the actual like three-dimensional version of this 2D image, what's important to render around, All right? And once you have an idea of what's important in the image, then you can kind of take a guess as to if I was gonna rotate around it, what the important angles would be. What if what you really care about is in the top left corner, then the way the three-dimensional image should act and rotate around would be the object in the corner. And right now systems are not good at that. So then you have this like additional CNN, this convolutional neural network that tells you where the priority is. And then you can plug in the more traditional actual nerf system that can try to make it three-dimensional. So you've got two AI models working together in this Melon model. It's a model of models. And the way Google researchers got them to talk to each other, they sort out kind of together what the best way to reconstruct this image is, what the best angle is, and then how to construct around it. And the reason we looked at raw nerf before we looked at this was the cool part is raw nerf actually got rid of the noise. It could help with the bokeh. And this actually solved those problems surprisingly without without that being an expectation of the researchers when they started. So Google got a twofer, new algorithm alert. Those folks over at MIT just open sourced this new algorithm, which is basically like giving prescription glasses to computer vision systems. And by the way, I really thought this was an ingenious idea. So when we have tokens, right? We tokenize text, they're word fragments. When we tokenize images and we tokenize video, we take little blocks, right? They could be thought of sort of like 100 pixels by 100 pixels, and then you break the image into a bunch of little squares, and then you have the system learn those little squares. Those are the tokens. They end up in this latent space. You do the mathematics, and you like can reconstruct things. You can build diffusion models. You can have computer vision to identify things. But here is where they got clever. Instead of making the squares smaller and smaller, which like skyrockets the amount of computation and actually doesn't even improve quality because as you get smaller and smaller, you start lo losing the patterns that can be learned in the first place for the, the tokens. Instead, they did something that they didn't say this in the paper, but actually reminds me of how the human eye evolved. They shook it a little bit. They kind of vibrated it. They kind of you know, shook it around. So imagine the squares are still like 100 pixels by 100 pixels, for example, but because you're sort of shaking it and you're learning different patterns at different shake points and you're teaching the algorithm when the, the camera or the image is like three pixels up, three pixels to the left, 10 pixels to the right, the different patterns it learns and it keeps using that same shake pattern it can pick up on much more detail in the image. So if you have this like big photograph of a crowd and you wanna like zoom in on a pothole or you want to look at it at a forest and like find some specific little animal that's out there, whatever, like or some geology thing, this can actually go see all of those tiny things that have been lost to computer vision and human vision. Now I'm definitely in the world of just speculation. So this is a thought that could definitely not be like real or whatever, but you know, I think they're called saccades or something, but if you actually look at the human eye, it jumps around. Like it has micro movements all the time. We have that dark spot in our eye, but it, it jumps. And of course we don't perceive any of that. Everything seems stable to us, but it does kind of make me wonder, like did nature find the same pattern or like were they inspired by 
the way the human eye works, maybe we see more detail because of this. And those two things kind of seemed like they were connected to me, but leave a comment if you know more about that. Yo, but kudos to MIT for open sourcing the new feed up method. Now I know what everybody's been waiting for this whole video. What does it look like when you run GPT-2 inside of an Excel spreadsheet? So this is a Sean. He actually did this four months ago, so it's not like breaking news, but it just showed up in the AI breakfast today. And I was like, that's crazy. I hadn't seen this before. Yeah, and it's pretty crazy because there's a lot of parameters, right, that define the, the function that kind of smooth out this interesting function that makes token predictions. But you can see on the spreadsheet layer by layer as it's going through its pattern finding and doing the math and like, you know, locating these tokens in this latent space. And it's just like fascinating. I didn't, now I didn't really have time to like go through his whole course, but there is, if you're interested in really knowing how transform models work, he's using this to teach. So it seems like a really interesting way to kind of get your head around what's happening inside the code that you can't always see because with the spreadsheet, you get to see every process happening in a visual way. Although actually another resource that if you really want to understand how these large language models are set up, you might want to check out this video on my channel called visual journey through a language models mind. Uh, and then if, if you actually want to see his original work, not my video, just going through it, it's right here on uh, the sources. So go down here and click on GitHub, be by craft or whatever, and you can actually see it. Or actually, sorry, go to his website, bycraft.net, and then click on this, LLM visualization. Yeah, I won't go through it right now, but you can see GPT-2 broken down here in all its components, and you can completely zoom in. And when you go through this chapter overview, it's actually gonna animate the whole thing. It is so cool. So look, there's your output, your softmax layer, your transformer, you can work backwards through it all. There's your embedding space, it's just, this was one of the most useful things I've ever seen. He just open sourced this for free. So he's really cool. And you can check out my whole video on it if you want. But you know, spreadsheets aren't your thing and you're more into goggles that point weapons at people and that are on top of robot dogs that use LiDAR to find themselves. Then check out this new weapon. Kids toy, I mean, excuse me. Oh my God, that little girl is definitely training for Skynet stuff. Oh my gosh. Do this man a Lockheed Martin internship now. I agreed. World War III is going to be crazy ASF. It seems harmless and funny, doesn't it? They're just machines. Yeah, so I actually remember covering that robot before. That's like the Chinese equivalent of Big Dog, and I think it's only $2,000. So yeah, that's a thing now. Oh, brah. I buried the lead. I'm sorry. That The whole video is supposed to be, like, I was supposed to lead with the Grok thing. Sorry, it's been a long day. Elon Musk is now open sourced. Grok. All right, so look, I'm in the camp that we shouldn't be open sourcing models, but because Meta's already doing it, it doesn't matter anymore. And I'm not gonna just sit here being like, I wish we didn't do it. Like it's happening. There's open source models coming every day. Right, and to be honest, I don't know, maybe open source is the better way to go. There are definitely some advantages I can come up with. So I'm always like kind of back and forth. I just, I get worried about really powerful technology being too widely available, but I totally get how you don't want it in the, the few elites hands either. So remember, after OpenAI had some major breakthroughs, ChatGPT is this huge success. Elon Musk gets jealous because he wanted to be, you know, in control of that company and they wouldn't let him. Then he's like, fine, I'm just going to start from scratch again. I'm going to create x.ai and I'm going to build a large language model. And to vi who knows how well that's been going, right? Like he bought a bunch of GPUs. He hired away some smart people. He's got tons of money. But at the end of the day, if you use Grok, it kind of feels like Llama 70B at most. Okay, so Matthew Berman did a great breakdown of what this model is all about. It's a mixture of experts model. So it has eight different experts, meaning these are like multiple agents kind of talking to one another to come up with the final answer. A little bit like people who in their head are like, I should say this, but then actually this, but then this, then this, then this. Imagine that happens eight times every time you query it. Now it's a big model, 314 billion parameters is huge. I mean, some people say GPT-4 is probably like a trillion. So that's like the top. But still, when you're talking, you're talking Llama 70B, that's 70 billion parameters. Grok is 314 billion. And of course, it's not always about size. That's why Matthew Berman did some testing. So one of his first tests is to see if he can code Snake. It can't. The code doesn't work. It imports the time module, which it doesn't even need. It's not even implemented in the code underneath it. But you know, sometimes you need to refine these. So eight experts, maybe it's not enough. Just go back and see if it can fix the error. No, it broke again. But anyways, all in all, it seems like a 
reasonably good open source model. It's better than a lot of stuff out there, but it's not top tier. But of course, Grok has access to all sorts of interesting information. Maybe there's ways that like Tesla AI and some of that embodied real world and robotic stuff can fit into these large language models. Maybe it'll get wrapped up into a bigger thing. I don't know. I, I, like we shouldn't really think about Grok as like its own thing. I think it's pieces that are all coming together for this inevitable future. But standalone, use GPT-4, maybe Claude. Actually, Claude 3, I think might be the best one out right now. All right, now let's get into everybody's favorite part of the video. The first paper that we're gonna talk about is called Text Dreamer Towards Zero Shot High Fidelity 3D Human Texture Generation. And there is a lot to digest from this work. Batman, Darth Vader, Joe Biden. All right, so this is a new way to generate a 3D image from a single flat image and a text prompt. All right, so behind the scenes, it has a sub model, which is a text to image model, right? And because that's a zero shot, that's like, like we talked about mixture of models in Grok. This is just a single like zero shot. Just take that, boom, it's a thing. And it's trained on a special Atlas data set, which has also been open sourced. According to the paper, it's the largest of its kind containing 50,000 high quality textures with corresponding text descriptions. So this data set is textures with text description. So that's what it's learning. The Atlas data set, largest of its kind, contains 50,000 high quality textures with corresponding text descriptions, right? And we needed a data set like this. It says it sets a new benchmark for 3D texture quality. And what we needed was a good data set, a good labeled data set. So thanks to the researchers for doing the hard work of building that, providing it to all of us to create incredible images of dancing figures like this. I mean, look at that coordinated dancing. Don't tell me they wouldn't win X Factor. Dancing with the stars. Oh, look, I've seen some stuff here in Vegas that looks just like that. And it's like 50 bucks a ticket. So that's pretty cool. All right, the next paper we're talking about is Pearl. Parameter effect reinforcement learning from human feedback. I know, they're just such good punchy titles. It's hard not to read it. But the gist of what they're doing is trying to make it easier to train a large language model, but do it in a way that aligns with human needs. So this is kind of moving us towards the, you know, the alignment problem so the AI doesn't get out of control and kill us all. Now it's using the same technique that you've probably heard before, RLHF, that's reinforcement learning from human feedback. But of course that takes a lot of time. That takes hundreds, thousands of people sitting there playing with the model, observing what the output is, and then giving it feedback to make it better. So these authors have come up with a new twist to make it more efficient called Perl. And they replaced the human with parameter efficient reinforcement learning Perl. All right, and it uses this thing that you could think of kind of like compression, it's called a LoRa to estimate how to make adjustments instead of actually adjusting all the parameters. So the thing is, to make it more human-like, it takes estimates, it does kind of guessing, it just makes like quick changes to the system. However, it doesn't require a human and it can do it like millions of times in a row. So the system becomes much better aligned without all of the effort that goes into human reinforcement learning. And after some testing, they said that it works pretty much just as well. So maybe Pearl? is the new RLHF. All right, so if you're worried about your thoughts being read, which I do occasionally, then you might wanna look away because today we are talking about this paper, Mind Eye 2, shared subject models that enable fMRI to images within one hour of data. All right, so you and me as a human, we lay down in an fMRI machine, scans our brain for one hour. And then Mind Eye 2, which is a new AI model that should be reading those brain signals converting them to images is now doing that, but upscaling the images so they're more clear and accurate. Don't know why we need this tech. No, actually there's like three reasons why we do need it. There's a few like medical reasons. And then there's like a million reasons we don't need it. But don't worry about it, whether we should, as long as we're preoccupied with whether or not we could. So what the model is doing is mapping brain waves to these clips. So it can just sort of search through like stock video and say, this is pretty much the closest thing that I know of that is what this person is thinking about. But this model is doing it with way less computational time, way less data, and just doing it more efficiently. All right, so for those of you that know I've been struggling with views and have been helping me out a lot, I wanted to give you a breakdown. My last video, I used all those like crazy catch words like insane, robot hunchback. Anthropic, Claude, Figure One, AI, all that stuff. I got 427 views. I mean, it's still not what I need to survive or anything, but I guess 425 is not too bad. You can see it's at the top of my normal chart. We got 66 hours of watch time, it made $2 and got one subscriber. Now, I know you guys don't love this, but I did want to address this little peak here. So you can clearly see at this point in the video, eight minutes and 47 seconds in, 
something was a little bit more captivating than the rest of the video. Okay, guys, can we get our head out of the gutter here, please? It's a Darwin AI example. Just kidding, what do I care? Click on whatever part you want on my video. It's fine with me. Maybe I'll just add a little Darwin AI every place in my video. Just keep the view clicks up at this point. Now I did just subscribe to David Shapiro's, uh, what do you call that, the Discord group, so I can chat with people in there. I thought that might be, like I don't know if I really do any online communities besides YouTube, so I think I need to start like driving traffic or at least getting my name out there more on like Twitter and Instagram and try to find a few more communities like Facebook. If you don't, actually if you know any Facebook groups or places where I should be to help get the word out of my channel, Put that in the descriptions below or go uh, to my about section. My email's in there. If you want to tell me about something like private or personal, I always check that email. 